Before moving to our boy's story, let's take a brief view of the event that transpired within the pages of the novel. As the protagonist of the novel Che Han escapes from the forest of darkness, he encounters the depths of human love. His friends and family in Harris Village, whom he holds dear, face massacre at the hands of an unknown organization. Despite his formidable power and years spent surviving in the forest of darkness, Han finds himself confronting this harrowing reality. Han, once pure and gentle, had never taken a life before. Yet, at this moment, he finds himself committing murder for the first time. With merciless slashes and stabs, he leaves behind a grim display of lifeless bodies and pools of blood. Only after the secret organization is dismantled does he begin to regain his senses. However, the lack of any useful information from them plunges him into despair. Vowing vengeance, he resolves to hunt down not only those responsible, but also all who played a part in bringing about this situation. After committing murder, Han experienced the weight of sadness for the first time. Departing from the village also for the first time, he arrives in the bustling city at the heart of Hinnatus Weston. Through a chance encounter, he crosses paths with Kale, who ends up thoroughly beaten by Han. Now turning to our hero Kim Roksu, who finds himself transformed into Kale Hinnatus. Prior to this unexpected turn of events, his day had been uneventful, spending his day off in an ordinary manner. He had borrowed The Birth of the Hero and simply dozed off while reading it. Contemplating his situation, he wonders if he's experiencing possession, finding it disconcerting to resemble Kale so closely. Reflecting on Volume 1, he recalls Kale Hennetis as a minor antagonist whose sole purpose was to highlight Che Han's brilliance. Relaxing in a hot bath, he muses that his current state isn't all that terrible. With no strong attachments, he acknowledges his status as an orphan without wealth, romantic entanglements, or close friends worth sacrificing for. He simply exists day by day, clinging to life because he hasn't yet met death. This had been the essence of Kim Roksu's life. However, he realizes he cannot simply die in this moment. Despite his aversion to pain and the prospect of a less-than-ideal existence, he concludes that living life in this world is preferable to the alternative. He checks his body for a scar, a reminder that he has yet to encounter Che Han. The tale recounts how Kale Hinnatus, known as the Trash of the Count, got drunk before his encounter with Che Han, resulting in the scar on his side. It all began because he found the taste of alcohol displeasing. Uncertain of what transpired with Kale following that incident, while Han embarks on a journey to meet Giant after enduring various trials and emerging as a conventional hero. After assuming the identity of Kale, Kim Roksu adopted a straightforward life motto, avoid getting hit from now on excluding the previously mentioned incident. Coiming out of the bathtub, he believes that he can likely continue progressing through the story independently. Opting to keep a low profile to ensure longevity, he resolves to steer clear of pain and find solace in life's simple pleasures. Embracing a relaxed attitude, he decides to take things easy. Fortunately, he retains clear memories of the novel's beginning, making his plan seem entirely feasible. Emerging from his thoughts, Kim Roksu responds to a voice addressing him as Young Master and confirming that he is still in the bath. Upon stepping out, he encounters Ron, a slightly aged man holding a cup of tea. Ron portrays himself as a harmless person, yet Roksu knows his true nature to be cruel and merciless, having crossed over from the eastern continent as an assassin. Despite considering the idea of handing over this dangerous individual to Che Han, Roksu outwardly expresses gratitude to him for his service. Ron isn't the sole dangerous individual by Roksu's side. There are numerous formidable individuals living here. Recognizing the necessity of strength to ensure his own protection in a continent on the brink of war, he understands the importance of attaining a respectable level of power. However, he also realizes the need to avoid drawing excessive attention by becoming too strong. His thoughts are held on pause as another servant of Kale approaches and announces plans to begin dressing him. Roksu asks to wear something simple. As he dresses in Kale's attire, he muses on his own handsomeness, noting how it effortlessly elevates any outfit. Reflecting, he acknowledges that the face is indeed the key to fashion. Once prepared, he instructs Ron to accompany him outside. Together, 
They proceed down the corridor, where servants line up, bowing respectfully and offering their morning greetings. Amidst the procession, Roxu catches a trembling voice uttering a greeting. Pausing momentarily, he contemplates whether the female servant is scared that her voice is trembling. Kale Henidus wasn't prone to physical violence. At most, he'd smash things when drunk. His tendencies leaned more toward revelry and alcohol, earning him the title of trash. Reflecting on this, Roxu wonders if it might be preferable for everyone to simply leave him alone. Ron interrupts his thoughts, announcing that he will now open the door and wishes Roxu an enjoyable breakfast. Grateful, Roxu expresses his thanks to Ron and tells him to eat as well. Upon entering, the lad discovers a vast dining table adorned with an array of breakfast dishes, with Kale's family seated around it, awaiting his arrival. Kale has quite the interesting family. His dad, Count Deeruth, is the head of the Hinnitus house. Then there's his stepmom, Countess Violin, and his younger brother Basin, as well as his little sister Lily. Kale's dad scolds him for being late again and tells him to take a seat. So, he plops down on the chair in front of his dad. The thing is, his dad doesn't have any power or anything like that. He's just loaded with money. On top of that, his stepmom and siblings tend to avoid him. So it's like he's living in his own little world. Everything's fine, except for the way they all stare at him. Kale asks his dad if there's something he wants to say, but it turns out there's nothing. He's starting to understand why they find him so hard to handle. So he decides to eat quickly and make his exit. As he takes his first bites, he can't help but savor the juicy sausages, causing a smile to spread across his lips. His little brother Basin is taken aback by the unexpected smile, but quickly turns away and apologizes for his earlier comment. Roxu thinks of him as a weirdo. He then glances at his wine glass, taking in its fragrant aroma as he gives it a sniff. Taking a sip, he relishes in the delicious taste of the wine. Suddenly, his father flinches, questioning that Roxu called it delicious, although it tasted like trash. Roxu quickly praises the delectable breakfast items, hoping to divert the attention away from the wine mishap. His father is pleased to see him enjoying the food, and Roxu encourages him to enjoy his meal as well. It feels good for Roxu that they aren't criticizing him for his lack of manners, and he loves being the family trash. Plus, he reminds himself not to annoy Basin too much. He contemplates the idea of avoiding the complexities of ruling the territory and instead, prefers to relax in a peaceful setting using his status as the Count's older brother. If that's not an option, he plans to leave for a place untouched by war. After finishing breakfast and wiping his face, his father inquires if he needs anything else. Roxu takes a moment to think, and then requests some money from him. With a smile, his father assures him that he will provide a generous amount. Roxu then asks for as much as his father can give, to which he agrees to give him all that he can. But when he glances at the cash, he is taken aback by the sheer amount. This house doesn't just have a lot of money, it's overflowing with it. And with this much, he'll have to revise his plans. He dials Ron's number, and he promptly appears before him, asking how he can assist. He inquires about today's date, too which Ron cheerfully responds that it's the 29th day of the third month in the 781st year of the Felix calendar. Hearing about the 29th day of the third month surprises him, making him realize he needs to hurry. Che Han will be arriving in Weston soon. He makes the decision to venture out into the city and is now seated in his carriage. After a while, he finds himself standing in front of a tea and poetry hall cafe. The carriage driver stands respectfully behind him. He turns around and gestures with his hand for the driver to head back. When he sees that the driver hasn't budged an inch, he speaks firmly and asks if he needs to repeat himself. The driver inquires if he truly doesn't want him to wait. Roxu nods affirmatively, stating that he will be staying there for a while. With that, he enters the cafe. As he walks in, everyone is surprised to see him as it suddenly becomes silent. He scans the room, searching for the owner. Locking eyes with someone, he wonders if he is the owner. A man approaches him and greets him warmly. He's that rich jerk Billows. Looking at his chubby little body, Roxu thinks Billows resembles a piggy bank. He takes out a few coins and places them on the counter. Then he tells Billows that he plans on staying on the third floor all day today. 
He instructs him to bring any tea that isn't bitter. As he turns away, he asks Billows if they have novels here or just poems. Billows replies with a yes, saying they have plenty of novels too. Roxu tells him to bring the most interesting ones in a cup of tea. Billows understands his orders perfectly. He hands him another coin and says he'll have more tea later. With a smile, Billows tells him that a million gallon is too much. Roxu casually tells him that he has a ton of money, so he can consider it as his tip. He's really taking advantage of his wealth, isn't he? I mean, when else would he do it if not now? He's just sitting there in the room, on a chair, lost in his thoughts. He can't help but think about that incident where Che Han was chased away from the gate early in the morning when he came to report the attack to the Count. Instead of focusing on finding information about the assassins and seeking justice for his loved ones, Han's priority was to give them a proper farewell. It makes him wonder about Han's compassionate nature. Why should the rulers of this land even care about some insignificant villagers who died? He remembers Kale Hennedis said that the cup of alcohol in his hand is worth more than all of their worthless lives. Han stayed silent for a moment, then speaks up, saying how intriguing it is. He's really curious to see if Kale will ever change his mind. He snatches Kale away from his jaws, suggesting they give it a try. Now Kim Roksu contemplates about this unexpected event has, and he shivers at the thought of that encounter. Sweat covers his body as he reminds himself to stop dwelling on the novel's contents. Suddenly, he glances outside and is horrified to see Che Han being halted by the guards near the building. Roxu wonders if they are asking for his identification papers. He peers outside and realizes that Han probably doesn't have anything to prove his identity. As he watches Han walk away, he feels relieved that his access has been denied. However, he knows that Han will obediently wait until nightfall to scale the walls and secretly enter the city. And then, he will come across drunk Kale Hinnitus. He rises from his seat and steps out of the room. He lets Billows know that he'll be gone for a while and asks him not to clear his spot. Billows nods in agreement. Roxu heads towards the exit door and walks outside. All eyes turn to him as he leaves. The onlookers are surprised that Roxu left without causing any trouble. Roxu overhears their whispers about him. He contemplates the fact that he should equip himself with skills and abilities to defend against powerful individuals, just in case he encounters any. As war is coming to this land, and he needs to be discreet but strong, to live long without any pain as it always finds company. He needs something like a magical spell, but his thoughts are diverted by a sweet aroma, and he finds himself in front of a shop. The shopkeeper is taken aback when he sees Kale standing in front of him and addresses him respectfully as, young master. He nervously welcomes him. Roxu, on the other hand, is no longer surprised by this reaction. He simply asks the shopkeeper for some bread. The man, still in shock, looks at him for confirmation. Ignoring the shopkeeper's startled expression, Roxu points to the stall and instructs him where to place the bread. He then tells the baker to pack it all and casually tosses a gold coin in front of him. Seeing that the dude is still in shock and not responding, Roxu tells him that he can go elsewhere if he doesn't want to make the sale. The owner quickly reassures him that it's not a problem and promises to pack everything up quickly. Once all the bread is packed and ready to go, Roxu hoists the sack onto his shoulder. He thinks to himself that he already knew this place was different, like a fantasy world. Feeling uncomfortable under the gazes of the people around him, he can't help but wonders that Kale must have been shady character, as their stares feel like bad karma. Letting out a sigh, he picks up his pace, determined to leave the area as soon as possible. Walking further, he notices people peeking at him from their doorways. Finally, he exits the city limits and reaches the outskirts. There he places down the sack and wipes sweat from his forehead. He turns to look back at the city and ponders that he has come a long way. And it's quite tiring since the bag is heavy. He pats a door in front of him calling it an old wooden door. He ponders just how old is this place? He looks at the huge tree in front of him and ponders that this tree looks hundred of years old. Suddenly he hears a child's voice from behind, saying that he can't approach that tree. He turns to see two little children standing there and telling him that he can't do it as it's a man-eating tree. The tree is notorious for consuming people. Legend has it that those who hang themselves on its branches turned into mummies overnight. 
This is the very tree Roxu has been searching for. Many years ago, in ancient times, there was a woman who was so obsessed with food that her gluttony led to her expulsion from the temple where she worked, eventually resulting in her death. A tree sprouted from her remains. The tree is said to hold the grudges and power of that woman. It is believed to possess the power of an indestructible shield, the very thing he has been seeking. With a heavy sigh, he gently taps the surface of the tree in search of the shield. Kids warn him to quit, or he'll kick the bucket. He gets annoyed by their voices, and thinks to himself that there are always nosy kids around. He makes up his mind to shoo them away before proceeding. He steps out the door and walks towards the children, making them flinch. The little girl gives him an innocent look and says that it's a tree that devours people, and he'll meet his end if he gets too close. Fuming. With anger, he hurls bread bags at them, and orders them to run. Yet, the child keeps insisting that it's a man-eating tree. Roxu looks around and wonders if they haven't heard of Kale, the trash? The little boy, upon hearing this, quickly grabs onto his sister and urges her to leave. The girl turns back and warns him once more not to approach the tree. Annoyed, Roxu glares at the girl and turns back to the tree to try again. He places another slice of bread on the tree's roots. To his surprise, the bread vanishes instantly. He gets spooked, fearing that his hand might get sucked in too. The shield holds the remnants of the deceased person's power. He contemplates the idea that this object holds an ancient power. Surprisingly, these wild and primitive beings are the ones he can rely on. He recalls the advice to keep feeding it until the darkness vanishes. This darkness was born out of resentment. Once it fades away, the light hidden within will emerge. And once he catches a glimpse of that light, the impenetrable shield will be his. He empties a bag of bread into it, instructing the tree to eat until it's satisfied. He is shocked to see that all the bread vanishes into the dark hole. All that he purchased is gone. He realizes he will have to buy ten more bags of bread. Peering into the darkness by the tree roots, he finds it a bit eerie, considering the size the grudge is too big. He makes a mental note to return the next day. Exiting through the wooden door, he is amazed to find children happily munching on bread by the wall. He quietly walks away, thinking to himself that the children are likely too afraid to approach the tree. It would be unfortunate if they were to stick their heads in the hole and get eaten. He realizes it wouldn't be bad for him, but rather for the innocent children. Suddenly, the children's focus shifts to him, and they look at him innocently. He turns to them and mentions that if they want more bread the next day, they must remain quiet. Later, he returns to the book cafe, and after some time, he descends from the third floor to inform Billows that he is leaving. Billows expresses his anticipation for the next visit, while Roxu compliments the tea and mentions that he found the book interesting, having read half of it. He appreciates how the main character's abilities are acknowledged and how they develop throughout the story. He jokingly asks Billows to keep the book exclusive for him, so he can continue reading it during his visits. Billows responds with a smile, stating that he will save the book specifically for his young master Kale. He kindly asks Kale to come again soon, as he eagerly awaits his return. Roxu assures him that he will definitely show up. A little while later, as he steps into a bar, someone eagerly approaches him to greet him. Observing the quivering tone in his voice, Roxu realizes that he is also frightened. It's understandable, considering that whenever Kale drinks, everything around him tends to shatter. Kim Roxu then tosses a coin towards the bartender and instructs him to fetch his regular bottle along with some roasted chicken breasts without any salt. The bartender questions if he would like to find a seat first. After not hearing back from him, he quickly dashes off to retrieve his order. Kale scans the area and smirks, knowing that the gangsters and scammers are purposely avoiding eye contact with him. It makes him realize that Kale is quite an unusual character. Typically, those from rich families trash tend to get along with gangsters and scammers, but Kale despised both types of people. He considered them to be lowlifes. Before leaving, the waiter arrives and serves him. As he walks towards the exit, he contemplates the mysterious bottle that Kale always drank. It's probably the priciest alcohol available in the store. He uncorks the bottle and takes a swig without bothering with a glass. As he strolls down the street, he revels in the warmth spreading through him from the drink. 
He tries to pinpoint its location, estimating it's about 100 steps from the city gate, next to the wall. Peeking around a corner, he confirms his suspicions as Che Han vaults over the wall. His gaze shifts to a tiny kitten being body slammed by a larger cat, hurtling towards the wall where it's about to crash. He contemplates the fact that in this world, coincidences have a significant impact. The scene from the novel flashes through his mind, where Han twists his ankle while trying to avoid stepping on the cat. As he turns around, he catches sight of Han, and Kim Roksu can't help but think what a kind person he seems to be. Finally finding him, Roksu starts to feel anxious. Thankfully, he's had a few drinks, which makes him feel more at ease. He decides that he should make a witty remark and leave a positive first impression. He walks up to the tiny kittens and notices that they seem quite hungry. He opens the bag of food and sets it down in front of them, urging them to eat. As the kittens approach the food, he realizes that they appear younger than he initially thought. He breaks off small pieces of meat and asks if they can handle chicken breasts. One of the kittens hisses and immediately opens its mouth. Roksu gently strokes its head, encouraging it to eat and get well soon. While patting them, he inquires if they have somewhere to go. Meanwhile, Han remains seated in the distance, maintaining his silence. Roksu raises his voice once more, asking if Han has no place to go or if he's not hungry. As expected, Han doesn't utter a word, leading Roksu to believe that he must be observing him. Undeterred, he asks again if Han is not hungry. This time, Han responds, admitting that he is indeed hungry. Roksu stands up and approaches him, positioning himself in front of Han. He instructs Han to follow him, promising to provide him with a satisfying meal. Roksu believes that by offering delicious food, he can make a great first impression. He instructs Han to come with him and stops in front of the kittens who are engrossed in their meal. Roksu reflects that he isn't particularly fond of cats, but these ones are undeniably adorable. Despite being captivated by the cats, he can't help but notice Han's stare. Roksu gently strokes the cats while questioning if they like his company. However, it's time for him to depart now. As a result, the cats jump off from his grip and run away, prompting Roksu to release a sigh of relief. Then Roksu continues to walk ahead, and Han is trailing behind him. He pretends not to notice, but Han is watching him closely. Roksu eventually turns around and questions what he is up to. He wonders if Han is once again assessing him to determine if he is an easy target to defeat. Han was lost in his thoughts when Roksu asked him if he was not coming in. Suddenly, someone addressed Roksu as the young master. This makes him angry as he wonders why they can't stop calling him young master every time. It frustrates him to hear them stuttering their words each time. They tell him to head inside. As they enter, Ron bows in front of him and welcomes him back. Roksu thanks him and thinks to himself that Ron was really waiting for him. He feels scared of this old man. Seeing Ron and Han staring at each other, Roksu ponders if he's just imagining it or if there's some kind of unusual tension between them. He suddenly breaks free from his thoughts and tells Han to accompany him. Ron asks about the situation and offers to help with the guest if the master tells him what he needs. Roksu politely declines the assistance and proceeds up the stairs with Han following closely behind. Now that Han and Ron have been introduced it was enough. Out of nowhere, another person calls out to him, referring to him as Sir and questioning if he has come back after drinking. Roksu glances at Hans, the deputy butler in charge of him. Without hesitation, he pretends to hurl the wine bottle in his direction, causing Hans to flinch followed by a flushed face. Roksu tells him that he will throw it for him next time. Ignoring Han's attempts to intervene, he strides toward the second kitchen where Han has to meet someone else. We see Vikras, the son of the assassin Ron. He's quite a fearsome character himself. With that expression on his face and those hands, he's been preparing all the food. Han needs to meet this guy because then Vikras witnessed Han's impressive skills in defeating Kale. He was astonished and chose to follow him. Roksu thinks it would be even better if he could convince Vikras to leave with Han as it might persuade Ron, his father, to come along as well. After snapping out of his thoughts, he reaches out and places his hand on Han's shoulder, instructing him to fetch some food for Han. With a perplexed expression, Vikras gazes at them. Roksu urges him to put down the knife and feed Han, 
who is hungry. Without hesitation, he obediently bows and follows his command. Roxu feels a sense of satisfaction knowing that Han, Vikras, and Ron have now been connected. He tells the chef to cook up something for him as he's feeling hungry too. Taking a seat, he instructs Vikras to whip up a delectable feast using only the finest ingredients. He can't help but compliment the amazing flavor of the steak that was prepared the previous day. He keeps showering him with praise, leaving Vikras perplexed. In order to create an extraordinary meal, he asks him to prepare something similar to that steak and then leaves the kitchen. At that moment, Hans inquires about how to handle the guest. Roxu declares that the guest is his responsibility and instructs Hans to attend to him. He reflects on the fact that the three of them have now crossed paths, considering his task for the day complete. If that's not sufficient, he plans to have Han confront someone while Vikras watches. He leaves, instructing Hans to bring food to his room once it's prepared. The scene transitions to Kale's father who is sitting in his office. Meanwhile, Butler Hans promptly informs him about Kale. He tells him that Kale visited the tea shop of the illegitimate son of the Flynn Merchant Guild and brought back a mysterious young man. He also mentions that Kale only had a small amount of alcohol and remained sober. Hans wonders if they should follow him. However, the father declines, stating that as long as he is in the city, everything falls under his authority. He instructs Hans to keep a close eye on Kale and report back to him regularly. Hans respectfully bows and agrees to carry out the order. Kale's father can't help but feel suspicious about the changes he's noticed in his son. 